Welcome everyone to this talk uh, and the material is partly based on work, uh, collaborative work also with Petrosan and some other of my colleagues and students. Uh, I didn't mention their names here but uh, just to say that I didn't uh, develop all these ideas. And uh, uh, I have tried to adapt the, um, each slide to the two broken screens, so everything is moving <laughs> 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 it up to the left. <laughs> Adaptive presentations. Okay, so the title of my talk is Weak Passwords and Strong Passwords. When to use them and how to protect them. Uh, implicitly assuming there is a place for weak passwords. Okay. And we use this simple picture uh, and the principle of uh, risk management. You know, if you are exposed to sensitive services and uh, high risk, you can spend more money and resources to protect yourself from those risks. Uh, and that is a, a, pass, a complicated password, uh, a high quality password, is a cost. It's more expensive to manage a good quality password than a simple password. And not just the structure and length of the password, but also how you deal with it, whether you write it down on a piece of paper or you keep it in an online unencrypted file uh, somewhere, as compared to uh, memorizing everything. Uh, so to follow this basic principle of risk management, there is definitely a place for using weak passwords, sometimes. For example, there is a simple service online and you just want to get online, actually register and get that service and you think, I will never ever go back to this service provider. I just want this one thing out of this service provider. But unfortunately, you have to register. You have to write your name, da 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 da, -da. And just, just in, in revenge, you write the simplest possible password just to get it registered. And you're done with it. And then maybe that password list gets hacked. Okay? And then I throw some and all his colleagues, you know, they jump on it and I analyze all these passwords and say, oh, it's terrible. People use these horribly weak passwords. Well, I did it on purpose. Yeah. Okay? There was a purpose to it. So there is a purpose of using weak passwords, sometimes. Uh, and many nation states have developed what they call uh, e-authentication frameworks. And uh, this is to provide a common approach to user authentication uh, to online government services. Uh, NIST in the US, in the United States, has developed one. Uh, European Union, uh, Australia, Norway, India is in the process of developing one, and many other countries. And typically, you will have these levels, like not all e-authentication frameworks have level zero. Zero means it's unauthenticated, you're anonymous. But uh, the Australian one included that just to be completely general. Level one. Um, minimal, minimal confidence is required in the identity assertion. You know, that's the uh, prose description of that level. Level two, low confidence is required in the identity assertion. Level three, moderate confidence is required in the identity assertion. And level four, high confidence required. So it goes from low, moderate, high. Uh, and you can read those documents and they provide more description of what it actually means. But here you already see uh, uh, the, the structure of different authentication requirements which would implicitly require different quality passwords, for example. So, for what is authentication assurance level one used. Typically, when the users self-register, you, you are invited to define your own name, you can call yourself Donald Duck, whatever. Uh, so there is no connection to your real identity. 
so a free subscription to some newspaper or some whatever online. This isn't directly uh, related because the e-authentication assurance levels are intended for online government services. Okay, and now I translate these uh, e-authentication levels into the typical any online service, not necessarily an e-government service. So, translated into a, a general purpose online service, authentication assurance level 2 would be used when the service provider wants to verify that the registered identity corresponds to the true identity and consequences associated with false identity are relatively low. So, you don't have high authentication assurance requirements, but you still do want to, you would prefer that it is the true identity which is registered. Level three, yeah, so level two was typically um, some kind of online paid subscription of something. And you usually have to pay with credit cards, so that is a um, uh, true identity anyway. Um, for example, Facebook, they want you to register with your true identity. Many people don't, but Facebook would be somewhere in between because you don't pay anything on Facebook. Well, you pay by exposing yourself to all their advertisements, not their comments. But you don't pay with a credit card. So you can lie to them, but they still would prefer that you write your own name. Level three would typically be used when uh, the true identity is required and there is significant consequence of false uh, authentication of uh, uh, identity, uh, which requires relatively strong authentication assurance. Your online bank would be level three, for example. Level four is also when you want a true identity and the consequence of false identity or false authentication will be very high. So you would require the highest possible or practical level of authentication assurance. Example, online election. Okay, some dictator hacks into the system and gets elected. Okay, that's even worse than your bank account being hacked. So that is a serious consequence. So for that you want authentication assurance level 4. This is what a typical e-authentication framework describes. And what are uh, these frameworks based on? Because they put down requirements. And there are three basic source requirements. Those green rounded rectangles are the basic source requirements. And they can be, be described as the user authentication method strength. That is, for example, a password is a method. Uh, or a one-time password generator is a method, a token is a method, biometrics is a method. Uh, that's a method. Now, user credential management, that is, for example, how they send you the token, or how they tell you the password, or how you get your identity. Do you have to turn up in person? Or do they simply send it uh, through the mail or online in an email, uh, for example? So there's a difference between the method, per se, and the way you manage that credential. Where do you actually write down the password? So the password itself might be, the password policy might be extremely strict, but if you don't manage your password properly, uh, the overall result is still weak because the management is weak. So those are the top, the, the two uh, source requirements at the top. Another one uh, at the right, user identity registration assurance. That is, if you manage to turn up somewhere and claim that you are somebody else than you really are, you get a good password and you manage your password correctly, the e-authentication is still wrong because they registered the wrong person in the first place. 
So every authentication afterwards, even if it's sort of technically correct, will be wrong. So the registration of the users is also important. That last factor is not always included in the e-authentication frameworks. For example, the Norwegian e-authentication framework has completely ignored that last factor. And I spoke with one representative of the government uh, that published uh, the Norwegian framework, and I said, oh, we don't consider that because in Norway everyone has a person number, so that's done. We are registered already. But now, uh, with the European Union uh, collaboration, we are required to provide services to all uh, people from Spain and Greece who come here to seek work. Uh, and I don't necessarily have a person number, but I need to get social services and this and that. <coughs> Not only that, uh, if you are an asylum seeker coming from uh, a war-torn country, and you arrive uh, at uh, Oslo airport, you get registered. Of course, some people, some of them lie about who they are or when they were born, but they still get uh, uh, an identity, and they can actually follow their case online. They can check out whether their case has been through this and that uh, uh, government office and uh, what the next stage in the processing of their asylum uh, request is. So, certainly Norway has to deal with all these people who don't have a personal number. And uh, we definitely need to include that uh, registration factor. And this is just a brief survey of uh, some of those e-authentication frameworks I mentioned. There is the NIST one, there is the European one called ID, or Identity for Authorities, Businesses, and Citizens. So ID, A, B, C. ID, A, B, C. And the Norwegian one is called the Framework for Authentication and Non-Repudiation. And then the Australian and the Indian one is called National E-Authentication Framework, simple as that. And they have more or less the same levels, but they give those levels different names. For example, uh, level 4 is called very high uh, by NIST and high, high, high uh, by most of the others, but India calls it substantial. You see, so there is a mismatch between the names, but the numbers are more or less the same. Uh, yeah. And if you look through those frameworks and look for what they say about passwords, because they do say things about passwords. We can look at the NIST one, and there was a comment about the NIST uh, 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 requirements this morning, uh, which were described as not very meaningful, but they say it's very technical. The probability of success of a targeted online guessing attack shall not exceed 2 to the minus 10 over the lifetime of the password, whatever that means. So that's an online attack, so it's not an offline brute force attack, but it's a kind of... The chances that you should be able to succeed through online attacks should be less than 1 to the minus 10. And there is no requirements about entropy for level one, that the password should not be transmitted in clear. For the European ID ABC, they simply say passwords or the PIN can be chosen by the user without any policy requirements about the quality of those passwords or things. And the Norwegian one says, it can be self-chosen and may be transmitted in clear. So this is in conflict with the list one, for example. The Australian one says, uh, you have memorized password or list of passwords, uh, and there should be a minimum entropy, but they don't specify what that entropy should be. So this is what you can read from those different uh, frameworks. Going to level 2, uh, the next one is very similar, but now it's 2 to the minus 14, sorry about the, the typo there, it should be uh, superscript. 
and at least uh, 10 bits of entropy, certainly. And now for the ID ABC level 2, the password must be randomly generated. For level 2. For your average uh, subscription or Facebook account, for example. Uh, the Norwegian one says uh, a static or a dynamic password can be used without any entropy requirements. And the Australian one says uh, you can have a memorized password or a list of passwords and they should have a minimum entropy, but they don't specify what that should be. And you should block the account if you mistype the password a number of times. So level three, now you get up to your online banking account. So now we require two-factor authentication, and in the list you can have a one-time password generator. So you cannot have a normal memorized password according to this. And the European one also requires two factors. And the password must be OTP, no static password allowed. Norwegian, the Norwegian framework requires two factors. A static password is allowed as one of the factors. And the other factor can be a one-time password. The Australian one requires two factors. Uh, and you must have a list of generated passwords, like a code book, which is more or less a one-time password. I don't, it doesn't really say whether you can reuse any of those passwords. And that's about it, because for level four, static passwords are not acceptable at, with NIST, with, uh, with none of them. Yeah, actually the widget one uh, does accept a generated static password, which would be a random static password for level 4. So the Norwegian framework is the only one where a static password is accepted. But none of the others accept any static passwords. And, uh, we did a survey of a few services and simply tried to well, look at what they required, what was the password policy for those services, and tried to estimate what a typical authentication assurance level would be for those services. And uh, Wikipedia, you can have a password of one character, it's possible. And you can have any character you want. It doesn't have to be a special character. <laughs> and we would say Wikipedia is assurance level one. You don't pay for it, you can be anybody you like, you can call yourself Donald Duck. To subscribe to New York Times, uh, the length must be between 5 and 15 characters. No uh, character type, character set requirements. And that would also be. Uh, assurance level one. A couple of universities, Oslo University and QUT, uh, that's Queensland University of Technology in Australia, minimum eight characters, and they have quite strict requirements regarding uh, character sets, uh, three or four different character sets, and some even require changing your password uh, every now and then that QT you have to change every two months. Which is a hazard. And uh, eBay, for example, um, you need at least six characters, uh, two different character sets. Uh, you don't need to change your eBay password 
Yes, there's a question. Just a short question. The character sets, does that mean Latin 1, uh, kanji? Yeah, the, the four, no, I mean uh, upper, lower, numbers, and special. So those are the four ones. Upper, lower, special, and uh, numbers. Yeah. So there are four. Uh, typically, we pass with four character sets. And then you get into online banking, uh, Citibank. Uh, this would be authentication assurance level three. Uh, minimum six characters for the also for the Norwegian bank Nordia. And uh, Samba is actually a bank from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. They require at least eight characters. Uh, yeah, not very strict password requirements. And then there is the SANS uh, Institute. Now they have published a policy, uh, what they consider as a good password policy. They don't specify for which services this policy is adequate. Uh, but the policy is, um, the password policy is fairly strict. For example, minimum 15 characters, at least three character sets, change every three months. So this will at least be suitable for level two and probably for level three. So this is not an actual service, but just an example uh, of uh, a policy, a theoretical policy. So you see, uh, the different password policies, even for uh, similar levels of authentication assurance, are vary uh, dramatically. And this is problematic, I would say, because users then we have to deal with so many different password policies uh, every time. And one of the initial ideas of uh, the work we did was that, well, first we started, one password policy to rule them all was what we said. And I said, no way, it doesn't work. And then we came up with, well, maybe we can have four password policies to rule them all. So that's more or less where we landed. And we said, let's, for each of these authentication assurance levels, try to articulate uh, reasonable password policies. And there is a lot of uh, detail you can put into those, or such, uh, password policies. And this is just some suggestions, really. I don't know whether you would agree, but for assurance level one, at least six characters, sounds reasonable. And you can have any characters that you want, no restrictions. Assurance level two, uh, maybe at least eight characters, that's what uh, many policies claim these days. And maybe use at least two character sets. And then some restrictions. Now, is it meaningful to reuse passwords? Studies show that people will reuse passwords, you know, because you have dozens of services and they have one password, you know, because they reuse the same password again and again. And for assurance level one, because there are no restrictions, we say it's okay. You may well reuse passwords for services that have assurance level one. It's okay. But as soon as you hit assurance level two, you shouldn't reuse passwords anymore. That's just a suggestion. Assurance level three, uh, we say you should have at least 13 uh, characters and use three character sets. And then we would say you should never ask your browser to remember your password. Well, I say no, ca no cache. Uh, but uh, it's simply storing your password somehow uh, in the browser or as a... Uh, as an assistant for you when you log on. And if ever you should be allowed to use a password for level four, then we say at least 15 characters, for example, use all possible character sets, all four of them. And one restriction should be the password should never be exposed in memory in an online device. How is that possible? I'll get back to this in a minute. Because when you type your password, 
even if you remember all your passwords in your head and they're top quality, you have to type your password. They are in the memory of your trying computer for a few seconds. <coughs> if there is, uh, if your computer is infected, there is a Trojan or some other malware on your computer, they can pick it up. And for the highest assurance level, for the strictest level, you don't want that to happen. Because the general, uh, the average computer is rather vulnerable to that kind of attacks. And to prevent those attacks and uh, stealing of passwords, you should never expose a password to, uh, mem to the memory of an online computer. OK, a password is a cow. You, know, you probably heard of the, the tragedy of the commons. Well, it comes from rural England, where a village typically, typically would have a village green, where the families uh, in that village would each have a cow grazing on the green, so they could have some milk. Now, one family figured out, we can have two cows, we get some more milk. And then the neighbors also realized, oh, we can have two cows too. And suddenly, some people started having three cows, started selling milk, and suddenly there was no more grass, no more milk. And that is the, uh, what happens when you have a shared resource without any centralized uh, control. So that's the, called the tragedy of the commons. What's the analogy to the passwords? Because the service provider, they think, we offer a service, and we want people to register. So we only want to place one password in the brain of that human who registers. Can't do any harm, it's just one password, isn't it? They don't realize that there are dozens and hundreds and thousands of other, millions of other services that also want to place a password in the same human brain. So, remembering one password is okay, but if you have to remember 50, your brain breaks down, and you can't remember any passwords anymore. So that's the analogy, that your brain is the common grazing field, and each password is like a cow. And every service provider is the family living in the village, they simply want to place a single cow on that brain, the green brain. And the same with your pockets, how many devices are you going to have in your pockets? Uh, and the typical uh, silo identity management scenario goes like this. You know, you want to access one service, and you get, uh, with one password and one identity, you get the service, you want to access another service, and another service you need a separate identity and password for each different service. And if you're the service provider, here comes one customer, and here's another one, and here's another one. It's easy because you have your CRM, your customer relationship management <coughs> software, and uh, your uh, Active Directory, and you take which takes care of everything, and even automated password recovery. So it's nice and simple for the service provider. Well, for us, you want to access one service, you get one set of credentials, another service, and another service, and it's a nightmare. We can't handle this anymore. And there are all these solutions around uh, to solve this problem. Federated identity management, for example. Uh, but that doesn't really solve the problem. Uh, we have a lot of passwords, don't we? Uh, and we have come up with the idea that we need actually a device which can assist, assist us in managing all our passwords. And because, as I just explained, you, can, you should never expose passwords to the memory of an online device. If you have an encrypted password file, well, each time you use a password, it gets decrypted and lives in memory for some time, where uh, malware can pick it up. That should be avoided, at least for uh, assurance level 4. Okay? And if you want to have a general purpose method, that fits any assurance level, then you would need something like this. And the idea is that it's a device which is not online. It doesn't have wireless LAN, 
it's not a mobile phone. It has limited communication capabilities. Let's say it has Bluetooth or some other short range communication capability. And you can have your all your passwords in there. So back to the uh, silo identity management uh, scenario again. Now uh, you see that there is this off pad, the offline personal authentication device, um, together with the terminal, the client terminal. So when the user wants to access one service, the off pad does it for him, automatically transmits the passwords, so that uh, the user doesn't have to remember it uh, any longer. So now, accessing lots of different services is, has become nice and simple, because you have a device. We have this in principle already, because you have um, yeah, password wallets in your computers, etc. So it exists, it's nothing new, but most of those solutions are actually live in an online device, and thereby expose passwords to the memory of that online device uh, at some point in time. This solution prevents or avoids that problem. So how can we then handle the problem of the vulnerable client? You, know, uh, you type your password that you might have remembered and the Trojan picks it up and sends it to the hacker. We want to prevent that. How can we use the off pad to prevent that? And the solution is that we have a challenge response protocol between the client computer and the off pad. And these challenge response protocols uh, are standardized. For example, there is the HTTP digest protocols uh, specified for as part of HTTP. But then the challenge response protocol goes between the client server and uh, sorry between the server and the client computer. So the password needs to be typed into the client computer. You only need to extend the digest the digest protocol, this challenge response protocol, from the client computer to the offline device, which a short range radio channel, so that the password is only exposed in memory inside the off pad. And the off pad only talks to the uh, client computer uh, through a challenge response protocol. So this completely avoids the exposure of passwords in clear to memory to, off to online computers. And uh, we think this is a solution which would support uh, authentication assurance level four, according to how we said it. You know, no expo never have exposure of uh, passwords in key text to any online device at all. So then, uh, uh, by having this, you have a general purpose solution. Uh, you don't need to just use this for the most sensitive uh, services, but it can also be used for any trivial service, or your level 2 and level 3 services. Uh, so it's a general purpose service. And the question is, will people have actually a, a separate device? They have their mobile phone already, uh, so we would like the mobile phone to do this, but the mobile phone is a connected device, it's got wireless LAN and it's got a GSM connection or a mobile connection. So in case uh, somebody wants to integrate the off pad with the mobile device, what then would be required is to have a kind of 
total separation between the two um, sets of functionality inside the same device. And you would sort of have to switch now. My, my device is now a phone. I can do my surfing and I can do my phone and call it. And I switch over and my device is now the uh, offline personal authentication device. Uh, the military, they like to have a physical air gap between you know, secure devices and other insecure devices. Uh, and the question is how uh, robust can you make this kind of separation between uh, an online and an offline device integrated into the same device. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more about this, so that really uh, concludes my talk. This is just uh, our sort of fantasy uh, imagination of how an uh, uh, off-pad could look like. And uh, we have a uh, project, research project going on where we uh, do try to implement this challenge response protocol, for example, where the off we have an offline device which talks to the client computer using an extended HTTP authentication protocol, for example. And we think this is a solution that can support uh, really good password management. Thank you for your attention. So, first of all, Professor Frank Stajano. <laughs> there you are. For those of you who were here at this conference last year, I presented something about people. What's the difference between this thing and what I spoke of last year? That is the same thing. It is. I think it is actually very much the same thing, which makes this even more fun to have the front stay on that. Frank, don't you have a prototype already, though? We don't have a prototype, well, I mean, we have a prototype made on a mobile phone, and I would not like the mobile phone prototype to be the real thing. We are, uh, I am, without the sanction, I am uh, building a team of people, including people who are going to build custom hardware for us, including people who are going to work on the uh, interaction design and psychology, parental psychology, to see what really works for real human beings, as opposed to what works for security needs. <laughs> I'm quite excited about this uh, uh, grant I received from the European Research Council this year, which allows me to hire uh, several people. And in fact, consider this as a job ad. I'm looking for smart people to join on this, uh, this project for several years, and it can be fun. Yeah, so just to repeat that very clearly, Frank will be speaking on Wednesday about you know something else but you're looking for four five four four people? yes four yeah frank is actually looking for four postdocs that are interested in working with him on his pico device and frank is for those who doesn't know him yet he's at cambridge in, in the uk university but questions for Erwin? Um, I wanted to ask, how do you authenticate who is asking for the challenge, uh, who is sending the challenge and asking for your password? Yeah, you need to service provider authentication as well. Uh, and we work on, yeah, there are solutions for that. So you need <coughs> mutual authentication, of course. I only focus on the user authentication aspect here. So, so it is handled inside the device already? Yeah, the device also takes care of the service provider authentication. Um, I thought it was very interesting up to the very last point that we said that the device uh, responds to the HTTP because then that is an online device which can be subject to uh, as well injection from the well, it's not HTTP, it's an extension. The HTTP protocol is between the client computer and the server, and you just have an extension from the client computer of the HTTP authentication digest. But then it's network still. I mean, the. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, it is network, but uh, it's not wireless LAN. And it's not a mobile phone, it's not broadband, it's not wireless LAN, it's. Uh, and uh, something, yeah, which, which must be carefully controlled. <laughs> and I'll see. <laughs> Other questions? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. First up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You go first. Up. 
Expected response. 